The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Expert Insights on Optimizing Patient Outcomes with Novel EHL F8 Strategies in Hemophilia A. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash SFD 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Stephen Pipe from the University of Michigan and uh, really excited to be here. Uh, and welcome to the National Bleeding Disorders Foundation Conference. So um, hopefully you guys are caught up on the, on the new, new rebranding. And welcome to this symposium on expert insights on optimizing patient outcomes with novel extended half-life factor eight strategies uh, in hemophilia A. And joining me today, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Stacy Corteau, who's from uh, Boston Children's Hospital, and we will be uh, tag-teaming today and sharing some uh, didactic information for you, but then we're also going to have time to discuss some cases to stimulate how you think about uh, the approach to patients using some of these novel therapies, and then uh, we'll have some time for some Q&A at the end. There will be some additional polling questions, so be ready during these presentations. We'll ask you for your opinion about a few things. So what are our goals for today? We want to augment your understanding of the mechanistic differences amongst the extended half-life factor eight products and some of the evidence that supports their use for prophylaxis and HEMA. We want to remind you about some of the remaining unmet needs and barriers for optimal prophylaxis in this group of patients, and hopefully uh, give you uh, some skills to develop personalized prophylactic regimens uh, using uh, all the available agents that we have uh, today. And we're going to give you some uh, tools to address the practical aspects of hemophilia A care that are associated with using these products, uh, principles all around patient education, monitoring for joint health, as well as uh, adverse event management. So we've seen quite an evolution in treatment products over uh, the last few decades from the days of plasma-derived materials. However, the cloning of the factor eight and factor nine genes in the early 1980s ushered in the recombinant era that uh, many of us have treated through over the last 30 years or so. Uh, the first recombinants were available in the early uh, 1990s. And then for really more than about 10 years now, we have incorporated through bioengineering strategies, extended half-life factor eight, as well as extended half-life factor nine. We've learned how to use these products and we've developed clinical experience and clinical data. And as many of you are aware, the first non-factor therapy, emicizumab, has been available now in the U.S. for about five years. And I'm sure a number of you have gained experience on using this product in the clinics. But what we're going to also talk to you today is about the newest extended half-life agent. And this uh, is the first agent to have a VWF independent property that impacts significantly its pharmacokinetics. That's what you're going to hear about more later. How important is prophylaxis? Well, uh, if you recall, still the only randomized clinical trial to demonstrate the importance of prophylaxis. This was the joint outcome study uh, that was done here uh, in the US, and it showed definitively the improved joint outcomes and the ability to prevent joint disease with regular prophylaxis uh, compared to on-demand. And if you uh, remember this data from the uh, Manko-Johnson paper, um, the uh, bars in the uh, green and the blue are the average number of uh, hemorrhages per month in the group that were on prophylaxis. And then if you look at the orange and the green, it was the individuals who were on episodic therapy, either joint hemorrhages or other hemorrhages. And you can see the stark difference in uh, the ability of prophylaxis to prevent the joint bleeds. And it was across all of the ages of the participants in that study. So prophylaxis is well incorporated now into global guidelines. It's indicated for all patients with a severe bleeding phenotype, which means that can be irrespective of their laboratory-based severity. And the WFH actually recommends targeting trough levels now that are in the 3% to 5% range. That was almost unachievable before the era of extended half-life uh, agents. And so now with the availability of these, those recommendations have been incorporated to hopefully enhance outcomes for patients. Routine scheduled dosing, however, typically ranges from every other day to two to three times per week. And for a lot of these agents, children often have a shorter half-life and have to have even uh, more frequent infusions. 
We've got comfortable doing uh, tailored dosing and uh, dose schedule based on weight and individual drug metabolism, so-called pharmacokinetic monitoring. And some of you may have had experience using these population pharmacokinetic tools uh, to tailor therapy um, quite easily in the clinics. And the benefits of all of these innovations have been to reduce the number of bleeding episodes and to enhance joint protection in our patients. You're going to hear more about the individual products that we've had available from Dr. Croteau, but just to let you know that in the extended half-life framework of bioengineering, this includes fusion proteins. Uh, primarily for factor VIII, it's the FC fusion, a molecule that we've been using now for a number of years. And then there's a number of conjugations, uh, different ways of adding a polyethylene glycol conjugates onto the factor VIII protein uh, to enhance its uh, half-life. And these have varying approvals and dosing strategies amongst the pediatric and adult applications. But they've all been highly effective when they've been used as prophylaxis. And the annualized bleed rates have shown significant improvement compared to certainly no prophylaxis. What you're going to hear more about is the newest agent, Afanisoctocog Alpha, so far only approved uh, in the U.S. And uh, uniquely, this agent has similar dosing for both pediatrics and adults. So despite all these advances, we still have some unmet needs in this group. We have barriers to the adoption of prophylaxis. I'm sure that was part of some of the questions and part of your voting that we did in the initial poll. Poor adherence to prophylactic regimens, recurrent bleeds despite uh, prophylaxis in a subset of patients, and we're also seeing significant health equities. Around the world, uh, we still have probably 75% of the world just do not have access to prophylactic treatments. Our patient community, and even us as treaters, we have expectations for better care. We want to have prophylaxis for all patients who have a relevant bleeding phenotype. We want to look for strategies to improve adherence to treatment. Our goal really remains to achieve zero bleeds, and particularly joint bleeds. And we'd like to see that as our boys grow up into adults, that they are free of uh, any residual joint damage. And uh, I think lastly, this is also an important one, we want to enable our uh, patients with uh, hemophilia A to live active lives and to live the life that they chose uh, unhindered uh, by their uh, condition or by their prophylactic treatment. The challenges of prophylaxis, I think, are indicated here. Across the top, you see the familiar peaks and troughs uh, using a standard half-life uh, factor eight. And although we're able to get full correction within uh, minutes after a single infusion, uh, very quickly, those plasma levels fall off fairly rapidly because of the relatively short half-life of factor VIII. And uh, it's not long before patients have already fallen down below where they are potentially at risk for uh, additional bleeding. We try to keep those troughs at a level that at least would prevent spontaneous bleeding, but we know our patients still uh, get uh, trauma-induced or physical activity-induced breakthrough bleeds on uh, uh, pretty uh, intensive regimens. What did the extended half-life uh, agents achieve? Well, these are relatively modest changes to the pharmacokinetics. It does extend the duration in the plasma, but the paradigm really isn't uh, shifted here, right? We still see a peak right after infusion, still a relatively rapid fall off over some number of hours. And if we don't intensify the prophylaxis, we really can't maintain higher trough levels. This is a list on the left of reasons that patients have indicated for switching from uh, standard half-life to extended half-life agents. And some of these, you know, longer half-life, the dosing interval, feeling more secure when they travel, et cetera, better advantages for surgery. But what we've highlighted in the red there are different reasons that come to mind depending if you are an adult with hemophilia using these products versus if you're a parent of a child. And so some of those differences there are interesting. Uh, it looks like uh, the longer stability at uh, regular temperature is more of an issue for adults with using these agents. The benefits for participating in sports are definitely uh, more of interest to uh, the younger patients. Your motivation to switch or uh, sufficient experience in practical use, also some differences between adult and what parents report related to their children. So Stacy, we're looking forward to you going through some of these EHL factory products for the group. Excellent. I'd like to add my welcome and good morning. So now we're going to move a little bit to speaking about our what have become our traditional or conventional EHL products, first generation, as you will, and talk a bit more about mechanisms to clinical efficacy.
So the similarity of the extended half-life products are many. And as you can see here, um, and as Dr. Pipe pointed out in the earlier number of slides, we have a variety of technologies that have been leveraged to increase the circulation time of factor eight. And you can see those listed on the left-hand side of the table there, including FC fusion and a few different approaches to pegylation. And these various approaches have included um, different size pegylation molecules, different approaches and location for the pegylation. But across each of these innovations, these engineering approaches, we can see that the half-life of factor eight um, sort of abuts that 19 hour mark and is very consistent across um, all of these factor eight products, uh, at least the mean factor eight level, especially uh, relative to the standard half-life or SHL comparators. And this really leads to, as many are familiar, a 1.4 to 1.6 or so fold increase in the circulation time, which depending on what your baseline half-life is, may actually lead to some improvements in actual reduction in frequency of infusions needed to achieve that canonical one to three deciliter, uh, IU per deciliter range. But if you have an ultra short half-life, may not actually enable a less frequent number of infusions. As Dr. Pipe mentioned, as we've moved from sort of 1.1 to 1, uh, 1 to 3 uh, IUs per deciliter troughs to the 3.5, the extended half-life molecules do have some advantage there, perhaps not in reducing the infusions to achieve that, but actually being able to achieve that without further increasing the frequency of infusions. It's important to recognize that when you're looking at the label and the dosing recommendations and the frequency of infusion recommendations that we see for each of these extended half-life factor eight molecules, those are of course informed by the designs of the pivotal trials. And each of the molecules and each of the programs used a slightly different approach to design their study to determine what they thought the ideal dose and infusion frequency was that they wanted to test. And in this table, you see evidence of variation in that study design. So for example, for recombinant 8FC, there was a treatment individualization with a goal of maintaining that 1 to 3% trough level across some of the pegylated factor eight products. Uh, we see just a fixed prophylaxis regimen and modification based on bleeding phenotype. So it's not actually the case that across our extended half-life factor eight molecules that really the goal and what drove the clinical trials and the design of the infusion regimens was PK guided. In most of these cases, as is commonly true with clinical trials, it was a small subset of the patients who underwent PK sampling to help better define the PK parameters. But there are some important clinical impacts, as we've mentioned, of the extended half-life factor eight prophylaxis. Even when you know, we think about how we would modify before the extended half-life products, our standard half-life products, it was very limited. All of the standard half-life products similarly have um, short and consistent half-lives. And so it was really with the introduction of our extended half-life products that we began to have more of an opportunity to individualize because we actually had products that could last longer, although there continued to be variability from patient to patient. And you can see two examples here on this slide of how one might leverage these products for individualization. So on the left-hand side, you see a potential opportunity for reducing the number of injections. This might lead to easier regimens with fewer injections per week, particularly in busy households or households with multiple individuals requiring factor infusions. And it may improve compliance or adherence depending on what the underlying drivers are of the challenges with the adherence fewer infusions may help that. But what you'll appreciate in the figure to the left, right, is you have one peak and then a slow decline in your factor eight levels. But each day that goes by, individuals are spending a longer proportion of their time at overall lower levels. When you look at the figure to the right, you see more frequent infusions lead to more peak levels, overall average of higher levels over time, slightly higher trough, because the best way to help improve your trough is to increase the frequency of your infusions. But of course, the obvious trade-off here is three infusions versus one infusion, for example. So the trade-off of more frequent peak levels of higher trough levels tends to be more frequent infusion when we're looking at SHL and our traditional EHL factor products. The more peaks, the higher troughs do, in addition, though, have the benefit of perhaps better protection if we're managing target joints, if we're managing busy physical activity, kids and young adults and older adults of all ages, better troughs, more frequent peaks may help mitigate bleeding phenotype and be more protective in that regard. 
So it really depends on what the underlying goal of the patient in front of you is and what their challenges are in terms of adherence, venous access, desire for physical activity, how we're going to leverage these agents to modify their regimen. And increasingly, we have tools to help us with this. So it's very difficult to turn patients into pin cushions and say, terrific, we're going to do some optimization. We're going to get a PK profile on you. I just need you to come in before your next factor infusion, wait around an hour, and then four or five more times in the next day or two, we're going to get more blood levels. So we really get a sense of what your factor levels are. Now we're actually able to leverage population PK profile modeling that allows us to take many fewer samples, perhaps two well-placed samples following an infusion to really generate that individualized PK profile for patients. And as we've looked at various studies, including the CHESS study that came out of Europe and others have done investigation of the utility of these PK profiles as well, we see that being able to engage patients, obtain their PK profile, and modify the regimen taking into account their PK, their goals, really does have beneficial impact on the clinical care, as well as in many cases, their adherence to the regimen. And that actually makes sense because that's actually helping to engage them more in their care, helping to give them a visualization of this is where my factor levels are, statement of this is what my goals are, and correlation between now I better understand how well protected I am at certain times when I want to do certain activities or when I'm experiencing flares of recurrent bleeds or other events. And so you can scan the QR codes here to help bring you to two tools. One I happen to use most commonly is the WAPS HEMO tool that came out of an academic group in McMaster and has curves for all factor products and is quite useful. There's also product-specific tools like MyPKFit that can be used with certain products within certain parameters, but both potentially can be helpful and instructive to both you and your patients when you're thinking about this optimization of prophylaxis. And now on the next few slides, we're going to use representative extended half-life factor eight molecules to demonstrate a few points. But many of these points actually have been published and demonstrated across each of the factor eight extended half-life molecules. So these aren't necessarily unique to the molecule in particular. But individualization, again, improving outcomes. So this is a bit of a busy slide, so I will help orient you. Here we're looking at median ABR, median annualized bleed rate on the y-axis. You see the number of the bleed rate there. And then we have four categories across the x-axis. The first grouping is individualized prophylaxis, the second fixed weekly prophylaxis, the third a modified prophylaxis, and the last on demand. And then we look at several types of annualized bleed rates. So in orange, we have the overall bleed rate. In green, the spontaneous. The small gray diamonds are joint. And then the blue triangles are spontaneous joint. And what you can appreciate is the group furthest to the left, the individualized prophylaxis, when you look across the various types of bleeding, overall, joint, spontaneous, et cetera, you see that with an individualized approach, in many cases, um, the mean annualized bleed rate is lower compared to just fixed prophylaxis, or certainly compared to an on-demand strategy that we see far to the right. Individual bleeding tendency does impact outcomes. And so this is, again, another of the extended half-life factor eight molecules looking at one of their extension studies, in this case, up to seven years. And again, on the y-axis, we're looking at median annualized bleed rate. But in this particular case, we're looking at their different groupings of approach to prophylaxis. So for this molecule, they had some individuals who were on twice-weekly prophylaxis, some that were on every five-day prophylaxis, every seven-day prophylaxis, or a bit of a variable frequency, as individuals might have switched between categories to find their optimal uh, prophylaxis. And what you can see is the overall um, median ABR varies, of course, amongst groups. And what might at first be a bit perplexing is it's interesting that those on an every seven-day regimen have a lower mean ABR compared to those on every five days or those on twice a week. Why is it that those who are dosing less frequently less factor eight levels have less bleeding. But I think what this helps demonstrate is it depends on the individual, right? PK, factor eight levels are not everything. All of those in here who take care of hemophilia patients know that some of your severe hemophilia patients bleed with a much worse phenotype than others, regardless of factor level. And depending on how you design the study from group to group, you're going to see a natural separation of those with an inherent less severe bleeding phenotype compared to those with a worse bleeding phenotype. 
And that might be related to their underlying physiology. That might be related to specific joint damage that they've incurred for various reasons, target joints that are being managed, such that by the time you um, sort of look, especially over a number of years, those that have migrated to an every seven day infusion regimen are those that are just clinically a less severe bleeding phenotype. And so we see an overall less um, bleeding rate those that have more difficulty with bleeding tend to have more frequent infusions, and so it sort of explains it there. And then if you look to the right with the percentage of patients with zero bleeds, somewhat similar, same treatment groups, same colorization across the table, and you'll see that overall the proportion of individuals with zero bleeding is relatively similar across the groups, again, because they've naturally sort of migrated uh, to the best prophylaxis regimen afforded by this product, at least, for them. But notice that the top of the graph only hits 80%. That patients with zero bleeds barely hit 50 to 60%. So it's still nearly 50% across the various categories that don't achieve zero bleeds. So while we see some stability, we also see some opportunity to further improve hemostasis and prophylaxis. And this also applies to improvements in adherence in improving treatment outcomes. So again, another extended half-life factor eight molecule, and you can see proportion of individuals with no annualized bleeds across the years. And you can see relative stability. If anything, for some of them, right, it might even seem like a bit of an upslope. But again, I just caution you that a lot of this has to do with study design and also the types of patients who continue to participate year after year in studies. So those who tend to be adherent, those who tend to be well-treated by their prophylactic regimen, of course, more likely to continue with that regimen in the study. So you sort of have a natural progression towards the best adherence, the individuals that are best suited to that prophylaxis. And then who knows about those individuals as you see sort of the total patients fall off over the years. Was that because they switched products, because they had to change their regimen, because something wasn't going well? But even here, with the best adherence, those who are sticking with this regimen have done so for five, six years, probably feel like this is a good regimen for me, 40 to 50% still with bleeds year on, year out. So still a great opportunity, even for those that sort of feel this is the best that they have for me, an opportunity for improvement. This was an interesting study that was just presented in abstract form just this past uh, summer at ISTH, looking at moderate physical activity with extended half-life prophylaxis and improving outcomes. And so small study, 13 individuals, they basically started these 13 individuals on um, a low-dose PK-guided prophylaxis for six months. And then during that initial six months, started to do more education about physical activity, more moderate activities. And then in the second six months, um, encouraged them to participate in more um, uh, moderate to vigorous exercise. And what you can appreciate is during the first six months, overall bleeding rates were higher than during the second six months with moderate exercise. And so I think two things uh, one can take away from this study. One is as we've seen with many factor products um, and non-factor products, that continued prophylaxis over time tends to help cool down joints, tends to help improve overall hemostasis. So we do naturally, in many cases, after the first six months for those that continue on various therapies and then beyond, see continued improvement in ABRs. But also in this case, in addition to improvement with just prophylaxis, they were then able to engage in moderate to vigorous activity, and that did not cause worsening of their ABR or even a higher sustained ABR. So prophylaxis is beneficial. So even for your patients who have struggled with prophylaxis or worse, have struggled with regular physical activity, hope that as you are convincing them, working with them to start prophylaxis, you can give them some guidance that says, let's at least start this. Let's hopefully get these joints under some better control, get you used to this regimen, and then we can start to, in a structured way, encourage more physical activity, perhaps up to moderate or vigorous physical activity without you feeling afraid or more at risk given your amount of protection. And we've also seen sort of the importance of improving trough levels. So this Propel study, again, leveraged one of the pegylated extended half-life factor eight products to actually compare two groups, those who had trough levels in the standard one to three range versus those who had trough levels in a higher eight to 12 range and looked at their amount of bleeding, the proportion of individuals with total zero bleeds. And so as you can see in the top figure here to the left, for those that maintained a trough level of 1% to 3%, about 42% were able to maintain zero bleeds. 
compared to 62% with those who maintain trough levels of 8 to 12%. So again, this tells you that many individuals seem to be well served even with our canonical 1 to 3% trough levels, perhaps due to learned physical activity and sort of learned management of their bleeding. But by improving the trough levels, we do see an incremental improvement in the individuals with zero bleeds, but still only to about 60%. So we're still in that sort of 40 to 60% range of we can probably do even better. We now have non-factor therapies as well, and that seems to help us target the mild range. When we look at the estimated mean total ABR in the 1.3 to 1.5 range, the proportion of individuals with zero bleeds still get in that 50 to 60% range. And we're targeting the mild range. So as many in the audience are, are well aware, we don't have a specific factor rate equivalence, of course, for the bispecific antibodies, the factor rate mimetics, but we anticipate it's somewhere in the mid-mild range. So there's both benefits and limitations of, you know, the extended half-life factor rates or factor rate concentrates in general versus emicizumab and non-factor replacement therapies. And you can sort of see that highlighted here. Of course, the factor rate concentrates give us something that we can measure, allow us to actually bring individuals into the normal range, though the trade-off, it's an IV infusion and levels then again fall pretty quickly, where non-factor therapies such as emicizumab provide a more consistent protection, but it's more consistent in the mid, low, mild hemophilia range. To date, the extended half-life products have not been demonstrated to be an increased inhibitor risk, at least in previously treated patients. That was well demonstrated in the pivotal trials and in the follow-up trials of each of the factor concentrates, as well as in additional observational studies that have been ongoing. Some of the extended half-life, including recombinant 8FC, have also completed PUP studies that did not demonstrate increased inhibitor risk in previously untreated patients, but not all products have, have been sort of fully fleshed out in our youngest patients. So in conclusion, you know, the extended half-life prophylaxis has multiple benefits. So there's an opportunity for decreased infusion frequency and reduction of treatment burden. There's a potential to improve adherence and reduce bleeding complications from missed doses. Again, that depends a bit on the underlying drivers as to what is causing problems with adherence to regimens. One actually has an ability for higher trough levels and improved hemostatic efficacy, because now with the factory circulating longer, if you're dosing daily or every other day with your extended half-life, as we saw in the Propel study, you actually can achieve those trough levels of 8 to 12 percent. Of course, again, with that trade-off of frequent infusions, but something that even with standard half-life products is incredibly difficult to achieve. And potentially also an improvement in quality of life and physical activity lifestyle, depending on the individual. So as we're thinking about optimization of prophylaxis, what are things that might encourage you to consider an extended half-life factor eight concentrate or even a non-factor therapy. And really it comes down to how well is the patient doing? Are we able to achieve the patient's prophylactic goals with the regimen that we're using presently or not? If we're having difficulty with venous access or poor adherence, if we need some higher peak levels and potentially even higher trough levels for physical activity, if we're having bleeding despite our best approach to dosing and maximizing the frequency of standard half-life products, switching over may make sense. And for some, it may even be my veins are tired, though it's not difficult. My adherence is tired in terms of how frequently I'm infusing and some desire for improved convenience. Okay. Well, thanks for that. That was terrific, uh, Stacey. You've really given us uh, a lot of uh, things to think about and some practical tools for our think about our approach using these agents. Well, now we're going to talk about something different, and we're going to discuss overcoming the limitations that are imposed by von Willebrand factor, all of these uh, factor eight therapies. So one thing I want to help you understand is that the binding of factor VDBF to VDABF imposes a ceiling on what all of the therapies to date have been able to achieve with respect to half-life extension. So factor VDBF and VDABF can be stored and released from the endothelium in the vasculature. And based on the concentrations and the high affinity of factor VIII for von Willebrand factor, this results in the vast majority of the factor VIII being bound to VDABF at any given time. But it is in an equilibrium, so it's an on-off. So there is always a proportion, maybe around 3 to 5% of the factor VIII that's circulating free, but all the rest is bound to von Willebrand factor. So what does that mean from a pharmacokinetic clearance? Of course, your clearance of these molecules is related to binding uh, to uh, clearance receptors on the surface of a number of different cell groups. We're showing you some of the receptors that have been characterized 
on liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, macrophages, as well as hepatocytes. And uh, some of these will bind uh, more efficiently to the free factor eight, but a number of them bind to the complex with the uh, von Willebrand factor. So with so much of the factor eight bound to VWF, factor eight is always subject to the same clearance mechanisms that are true for von Willebrand factor. So if we want to extend a half-life that's beyond the half-life of the von Willebrand factor molecule, we have to come up with a different strategy. And what's really been demonstrated now is we have to divorce factor VIII from this necessity of being stabilized by the endogenous factor VIII in the clotting system. When you infuse any standard half-life factor VIII or extended half-life factor VIII, it essentially immediately binds to von Willebrand factor and this uh, creates that ceiling for the half-life. So how can we divorce these infused factor VIII from having any binding affinity for endogenous factor VIII? So let me walk you through the construction of Phanisoctocog alpha. So the base molecule is based on the FC fusion factor VIII that Stacy has already reviewed. And this is showing the functional A domains and C domains of factor VIII and then the FC fusion. So we've been comfortable using this now for a number of years. It turns out that the binding sites for factor VIII to von Willebrand factor are primarily located on these C domains, and they interact with a specific portion of the von Willebrand factor molecule, which are called the D' prime D3 domains. And it turns out that if you just take a recombinant fragment of VWF that has those domains, it will bind with high affinity to factor VIII, and it will block its ability to bind endogenous VWF, and it will provide the stabilization in plasma that we're used to seeing. Uh, but if we only had the D' prime D3, because of that on-off of the factor VIII and VWF, it would eventually dissociate from the D' prime D3 and then bind to the endogenous, and we wouldn't get a sustained effect. So to covalently link the D' prime D3 to the molecule, um, the D' prime D3 also has an FC fusion, and this allows this to be covalently linked as a, a fixed dimer. And in addition, they have introduced these repeating polypeptide sequences on the A domains and then across the bottom of the molecule here. These present hydrophilic repeating sequences. They're natural amino acids, but they shield the protein from proteolytic degradation and block binding to those clearance receptors, which I showed you. Now, when factor VIII needs to get activated by the clotting system, all the natural Stroman cleavage sites are still there in the molecule. And turns out when those natural sites get cleaved by thrombin, they cleave off those extend sequences to leave the natural factor VIII protein behind. But in addition, they engineered an additional thrombin cleavage site so it would cleave this uh, FCD prime uh, D3 uh, fusion and liberate it from that molecule. So that way, after activation with normal blood clotting, the active factor VIII can exert its cofactor function. So what's the impact when we do that? So this comes from the early phase uh, trial for these molecules. And what we're comparing, a standard 50 unit per kilo dose, and then looking at the fall off that's related to the standard half-life in red, extended half-life in blue, and then phanisoctocog alpha here in green. And we see indeed that we've been able to uh, go past the VWF imposed ceiling by divorcing it from uh, endogenous of VWF. You can see about 1.5 fold improvement in the half-life for the pegylated version here. And then look at the impact of uh, phanisoctocog alpha. And what I really want to point out here are two things. We sort of accept that the non-hemophilic range is anything above 40% with a single dose Patients are remaining in the normal range, so non-hemophilic range, for at least the first four days after an infusion. And at the trough levels in this study, uh, patients were down around 10 to 15 percent. So this has now been published showing a pivotal trial here. And there were two groups that came into the study. There's those who are already in prophylaxis who uh, went on to a, a prophylaxis arm. And then there were also individuals who had been on on-demand who continued on on-demand of phanisoctocog and then switched to the uh, prophylaxis subsequently. And the primary endpoint here looking at was the, the annualized uh, bleed rate in the prophylaxis treatment arm. So this is the headline data. So in the patients who were on a phanisoctocog prophylaxis, the median annualized bleed rate was zero. 
and the estimated mean uh, uh, annualized bleed rate was just slightly above zero at 0 0.71. And then if we look at the proportion of patients with zero bleeding uh, episodes, it was 65%. So we're bumping patients now into substantial uh, degrees of uh, bleed control through this strategy. If we look at those, because some patients came into the study on prophylaxis with their prior agent, and we were able to establish what their baseline estimated mean annualized bleed rate was just shy of three bleeds per year. And there was a 77% reduction in their mean estimated annualized bleed rate after the switch to a Phanisoctacog alpha. Noted again, there was no development of inhibitors in these experienced population of patients. We're also seeing from these studies some additional endpoints that I think are relevant. So they looked at several aspects of joint health, physical health using the hemoqual quality of life instrument, pain using the PROMISE pain instrument, and then the HGHS joint health score. And there were significant improvements in these patients after they switched to Panasoctacog alpha across these three important joint health outcomes. What about safety? No development inhibitors were detected. There were no reports of serious allergic reactions, anaphylaxis, or vascular thrombotic events. The most common adverse events uh, overall, at least those were reported in at least 5% of the patients were headache, arthralgia, falls, back pain. These are not dissimilar to other clinical trial participants. There were, interestingly, 11 patients who tested positive for pre-existing anti-drug antibodies before they even received a Phanisoctacog alpha. This has actually been seen with other uh, types of uh, molecules that we've given to patients. But there was no discernible effect of these pre-existing uh, antibodies, anti-drug antibodies, on the PK variables uh, compared to those who were antibody negative. So these don't appear to be clinically significant. Now, we've sought some additional data at the most recent ISTH conference. These are not comparisons in the same trials. This is really using a meta-analysis approach, and, and they're using a matching method to match patients through meta-analysis from the published trials with existing standard half-life factor rates, uh, and then comparing it to the observations from the EXTEND trial. And uh, compared to the data from the standard half-life for common factor eight therapies, there was significantly lower rates of any bleed, spontaneous bleed, joint bleeds, compared to standard half-life factory product prophylaxis. What about two existing extended half-life factor rates? Well, again, using a similar approach of matching patients, Phanisoctacog alpha was associated with significantly lower rates of any bleed, spontaneous bleed, and joint bleeds compared to EHL uh, factory products that are listed here. And overall, the frequency of bleeds was reduced by about 77%. Well, what about comparison to emicizumab? Now, we're limited here to just two studies for this meta-analysis matching comparison. So we just have the EXTEND-1 arm A, and then we also have what was called arm D from the HAVEN-3 study, which was the prophylaxis arm in the non-inhibitor patients who were on weekly emicizumab prophylaxis. But even here, there was an efficacy benefit of aphanisoctacog over emicizumab significantly reduced rates of any bleed, any treated bleed, and treated joint bleeds. The only one that didn't reach statistical significance in this comparison was the annualized bleed rate for a spontaneous treated bleeds. In addition, we also can demonstrate improvements in the hemophilia joint health score, since that was included also in the EXTEND-1 study, and there was also evidence of some improvement in aphanisoctacog compared to what was observed with emicizumab. Now, the new data that was presented at IST included the EXTEND KIDS trial. So now here, they just took patients and uh, moved everyone. There was about 74 patients in the study who uh, went directly to prophylaxis with a aphanisoctacog at the fixed dosing. It was a mix of individuals who were less than six years old and those who were between six to 12 years old. And in that study, the mean ABRs were zero and 0 0.89, and 64% of the patients had zero bleeding episodes, 82% of the patients had zero joint bleeds, and 88% of the patients had zero uh, spontaneous bleeds. So I think people were really impressed by the bleed control achieved in the pediatric population with this agent. So Phanisoctacog alpha is the first recombinant factor eight that breaks the VWF-imposed ceiling for plasma half-life, and the once-weekly dosing 
has been shown to be effective in both pediatric and adult patients with HEME. It maintains normal to near normal factor VIII plasma levels for the majority of the week after a single infusion. And we're seeing improved PKs associated with improvements in important physical health parameters, pain, and overall joint health, and has been shown to be safe and well tolerated without an increase in inhibitors. So in this next section, we're going to look at two cases together between Dr. Croteau, and we're going to have a discussion, and we're going to see how we would apply some of the principles that we've tackled so far today. So Stacey, that's a case we want to take up here to a certain degree. So consider a pediatric patient with severe HEME. Their parents are wondering what the options for treatment are, how protected the patient will be, um, and uh, really uh, how to proceed. So um, I would just invite you to think about patients that you're seeing every day uh, in your clinics. Uh, what do you discuss with them about what the treatments are for prophylaxis? No, I think it's a great question and one that you know many of us face regularly. I generally start broad strokes. So we have two categories of treatment. We have an opportunity to replace your factor eight. We can talk about different types of factor eight concentrates. Then we also talk about the non-factor um, concentrates, emicizumab, for example. Um, and so I think, especially for new families, for younger families, um, starting sort of high level can be really helpful. And then we talk about some of the trade-offs, of course, between factor replacement versus non-factor replacement. And some of these we highlighted, hopefully, for you earlier in the talk. So with factor eight replacements, we're able to normalize and measure your factor eight level. For various activities, we can bring you up into the normal range. When you have bleed events, we sort of anticipate where your factor levels are, and we can modify your regimen in that way. The downside, of course, being it requires IV infusion skills. So either being tethered to a home infusion company or coming in for infusions until you or your child um, are able to develop self-infusion skills to sort of liberate you from additional medical support. And then in the non-factor category, of course, right now we have emicizumab by specific antibody. The benefits there are that it keeps you out of the severe range. It puts you somewhere in the mild hemophilia range consistently. You don't know exactly how well protected you are in that range. It doesn't bring you up into the normal range. It doesn't normalize your hemostasis. But our experience so far has demonstrated that it affords very good prophylaxis for most daily activities and even for a lot of sports and athletic events. And it's not IV, it's subcutaneous. So from a skill building perspective, much easier for parents and patients themselves to learn how to inject. So you sort of have the trade-off of potentially being in the normal range versus not, but IV, more frequent therapy versus subcutaneous, less frequent. Does your discussion change depending whether you're talking to like a preschool level, a family with preschooler versus, you know, well into school age, maybe even early high school versus say a young adult? So I think we're in such a golden time of changes in hemophilia treatment that it does in the moment, right? Because by definition, sort of presently, my older school age and young adult kids are old enough to remember before the bispecific antibody. So many of those individuals or parents already have IV skills and peripheral infusion skills. And so it's a little bit of a different um, skill building consideration. And the trade-offs are a little different than brand new families who've never heard hemophilia, who've never heard home infusion nursing, who are terrified of the idea of trying to pin down their two or three-year-olds um, to do an IV infusion. And so I think often gravitate more towards an opportunity for subcutaneous, at least initially. Um, but from a physical activity perspective, from a skill building perspective, it's a lot of the same considerations. And even some of my very active toddlers, parents feel that having a factor eight concentrate, being able to modify the levels sort of trumps an easy subcutaneous where others say, gosh, subcutaneous, good overall protection, that is just the ticket. And then similarly, as individuals get older, depending on their physical activity needs, if they're varsity athletes, if they're more poem writers, bookish, they may make different decisions. So when parents are encouraging their kids or inviting their kids to start doing a new activity, or if it's a high schooler, he now wants to play on a varsity sport, what are you telling them about physical activity and the different treatments that maybe have been on now for a number of years? Absolutely. So at my institution, we've, as many know, we've been a big fan of PK-guided prophylaxis for quite a long time. So for all of our patients on factor concentrates, we have a sense of their individual PK profiles that we're able to leverage to help inform our decision-making around physical activities and what have you. And so whether you're on emicizumab, whether you're on factor concentrate therapy, 
I emphasize the importance of listening to your body. So we are very much proponents of regular physical activity of individuals sort of achieving their goals and participating in the sports and athletics that they want to with a reasonable safety margin. Um, but the importance of thinking through, not making dangerous decisions, not skipping out on important safety equipment, but really knowing where their levels are. And if you are on, say, emesizumab and you're playing a varsity sport, listen to your body. If you get need in the thigh, if you go sliding into home, if you feel a pop in your thigh as you're sprinting across the finish line, it's important to listen to that and to not just go to bed on it um, and hope for the best, even though it's sore and getting more swollen for a day or two, and then you call me on day four or five. Listen to your body. You may still need treatment, whether you're on factor prophylaxis or emesizumab prophylaxis, so that we can help keep you safe, but also really regularly engaged with physical activities. Great. So some of the things we talked about here is reviewing the available therapeutic options, reviewing the advantages and disadvantages of each one, and then really tying back into the patient's treatment and lifestyle goals. And so it's a personalization of therapy. It's not limited to PK personalization, Absolutely. but really incorporating all the aspects of how the patient wants to live. I agree. It's the nice benefit of having this armamentarium of various therapies. We can individualize within different treatments, but also offer sort of a variety of treatments. So now we have a young adult, I guess. So now we are kind of graduating into those older individuals. So Steve, if you have a young adult patient with hemophilia A, no inhibitors, but already some degree of joint damage, challenged adherence to his current standard half-life factor eight prophylaxis, how do you manage that? How do you sort of talk him through what his options are? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of disappointing that some of our guys that have graduated up into their you know, mid-20s or maybe early 30s that we've had on primary prophylaxis all this time. Uh, we recognize that some of them still have joint disease. And uh, uh, we also um, see them struggling with adherence. And when I think about the questions that a lot of you submitted, some of the polling questions, adherence, it seems, is still a significant problem. And I think the consequences going forward for continued poor adherence is with established joint disease, they're going to still have potentially target joints and uh, recurrent bleeding. And we fear for what the continued deterioration is of those joints over time and what the impact is going to be on their life, chronic pain, impact on quality of life, their ability to do things with their families. So I think we go back to what's the goals for the individual patient and some of the things that might inform the decisions we make about whether they stick with their current therapy, switch to standard, uh, extended half-life or uh, to emesizumab. Uh, really, we're going to talk about, okay, what kind of school or work are you engaged in? How uh, physically active are you on the job? Or what kind of activities do you like to do, you know, for recreation? And then listening to them about, is there a joint limitation? Is there a chronic pain issue going on? And I think we make decisions about which platform of therapy to use based on how the patient is sharing those concerns with us. I don't think there's a single right therapy that would really blanket cover everybody. And I think in this specific example, if this young man has been on, say, emesizumab for the last five years or so, I don't think it's insignificant choice to suggest to him, oh, you should just go back to IV, IV infusions. I mean, if he's incorporated this into his daily life and he's enjoying sub-Q, not being wedded to a regular, you know, fixed regimen for infusions, I think it's not an easy decision to switch if you like, back to an IV form of therapy. But if I can get him to think about what he wants to achieve, and if I think something like a phanisoctocog is going to help him get there, then maybe I can convince him that maybe a once-a-week dosing with this because of the sustained in the non-hemophilic range for a number of days, maybe that is the solution for what he's trying to achieve. I don't think there's a real safety issue as part of these considerations. I think there are some flexibilities that we can think about in dosing. I think that would be sort of my approach to that discussion. So maybe what we didn't talk about is the role of joint evaluation, trying to understand what's going on in the patient and some of the tools that we now have available to do that. We're definitely going to discuss all the factors. Now, it wasn't part of today's discussion, but this young adult struggling with adherence, I think he's a great candidate to at least start a discussion about gene therapy. We have first approved therapy. Some of these guys with poor adherence over the years, I think they're outstanding individuals to bring in and start that conversation about whether gene therapy might be right for them. Thank you about the adherence. As you're mentioning, I do you think exploring with patients why they're non-adherent is really important? Whether it, does he feel like it's futile? I've been doing my infusions, but my joints hurt anyway. I'm bleeding anyway. I'm giving up. 
Am I too busy? Am I having Venus access issues? Or I've been actually surprised if we've been exploring this more. There's a fair amount of needle phobia that continues, even in our hemophilia patients that you think, oh, those guys and gals must have it because they're doing regular infusions all the time. Why would they be afraid of needles? But whether it's IV infusions or even subcutaneous infusions, that continues to be an emotional and an important barrier for individuals. So exploring that and making sure we're providing the right supports and perhaps in those situations, while they're poorly adherent to their factor emicizumab and you say, oh gosh, what a terrible gene therapy candidate. How am I going to get them to adhere to coming for labs and doing these other types of things? If you're dealing more with a needle phobia or some type of adherence that would be easily mitigated, may sort of help you reconsider some of these other options. Yeah. We want to focus on the patient's treatment and lifestyle goals, personalizing the therapy. And I think this comes down to shared decision-making. Hopefully all of us are developing additional skills on how we talk to patients, listening to them, like you said, uh, helping them to listen to their own bodies, but also listening to them in clinic. What are their aspirations? What are their goals? And trying to match the therapy to their particular situation. I think it's a wonderful time to be managing patients in hemophilia. I think we've got tools that can take us to all different directions to enhance prophylaxis and to enhance outcomes for patients. And I'm excited that we had an opportunity to talk about this new agent available to us. And hopefully you'll hear more about all the therapies that we're all using in our clinics today. We have time to go through some of the questions. Okay, so Stacey, what do you recommend for patients who want to use sub-Q, but also want to use EFA as needed for their breakthrough bleeds? Do you think this is a good combination? I don't have any concerns for safety and leveraging this combination. Probably the biggest barrier in this particular case may be um, insurance coverage, depending on where you live, in truth, um, to both uh, just re PRN doses of, um, of EFA as well as use of emicizumab. Um, however, like I said, no safety concerns. And to, to the degree that you're having a minor procedure or even some more significant joint bleed that does require you to normalize your factor eight, of course, um, you know, EFA allows for similar recoveries to the other products but better overall um, protection, so may still afford fewer factor eight infusions to help mitigate bleeding. So is, I think it's a reasonable combination uh, if you can make it happen. Yeah, and I, I think you probably have to share the same experience as us. The longer patients, particularly younger ones who've been on uh, uh, emicizumab for a right. long time, the ability to do repeated IV infusions in the home setting to treat a, a breakthrough bleed has become increasingly challenged. And asking them to come back to a local ED or come to the clinic to get follow-up infusions. What I really like about a phanisoctocog, I think for almost all situations, a single dose is going to keep them in a sustained non-hemophilic range for multiple days and probably be the only treatment that they would need for that particular breakthrough bleed. And I think there's nothing uh, that we understand about emicizumab and concomitant factor eight that would suggest that there's a safety issue there. Great. So is there any data um, on standard half-life versus extended half-life when treating an active uh, bleeding episode or with trauma? So do you, do you see any difference between these molecules? Is there, is there any argument that we should only be using a standard half-life for, for treating breakthrough bleeds? Um, or are there some potential advantages from the EHLs for acute bleed management? So I don't think that there's a huge advantage for the conventional EFLs over uh, over standard half-life um, because the you know half-life extension is is more nominal compared to what we were just speaking about. And so while for some minor bleeds, you may get away with one dose of an extended compared to standard half-life, in many cases, one dose of standard half-life is perfectly adequate as well. And also just a, a quick caution to remind you when we're thinking about PK and we look at these curves, that of course is in steady state um, situations. And so when you're having active bleeding, especially depending where and how severe bleeding, your factor levels will drop more quickly than when we're looking at stand, um, uh, baseline, otherwise healthy prophylaxis. So please don't take away that with an active intracranial bleed or a major muscle bleed that you give one dose of one of these medications and you know three and four days later, you're still going to be above 40% because you will consume and your levels will drop. So it remains important to keep track of good hemostasis potentially follows some levels depending on the severity of bleeding that you're achieving. So with the newer products, you may have some better benefit um, but I feel that in the bleed situation, EHLs and SHLs are more interchangeable in terms of degree of hemostasis and probably total number of doses that one needs. So maybe the last question we'll take um, 
How do you assess an individual patient's response to their prophylactic approach? And what adjustments do you then make based on how you follow them? So I guess what we're trying to get at here is, so you've chosen a particular regimen. Yeah. Is bleed, reported bleed outcomes the only measure of whether that therapy is optimized for them? Or are there other parameters that you're looking at when you're following your patients? Perfect. So at our center, we actually look at a number of parameters. We do look and see where are your factor levels, what's your PK profile look like. We, of course, look for overt joint bleeds. We also look for subtle bleeds. Are you having any joint aches or pains? How do you feel on this medication? How is the infusion cadence going for you? Are you having struggles with venous access, um, struggles with adherence? Because each one of those individual parameters might suggest an opportunity to individualize their regimen. How about you? I think we make judgments based on where patients' trough levels are. So I, I don't think we, we trust that just because they're not reporting overt bleeds, I don't feel comfortable leaving patients down at trough levels that are just barely you know, above 1%. So I think we have been more aggressive, and I think that drove some of the WFH um, guidance uh, that was revised um, a couple of years ago. Um, I think we do pay attention to even um, uh, factor eight like levels on emicizumab. Um, there's not a lot of variation, interpatient uh, variability, but um, I, I think I have seen a few patients that have been maybe at the lower bounds of that factor eight like activity. And so if we have an opportunity to modify their, their dose and regimen to uh, try to optimize that. So I, I, I think increasingly I've been concerned that simply relying on just overt bleeding is missing some important potential outcome determinants for patients. I agree. I think yeah. relying just on bleeding, relying just on factor levels, there's not one right parameter. I think kind of integrating this information is where we really shine as comprehensive centers and why it's so important for us to help be involved in the severe bleeding disorder community. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. I hope this was informative. There is going to be a post-test uh, evaluation that you'll need to get your credit, so please follow through on that. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash SFD 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Sanofi.